Sorry about that. Okay, so I'm excited to be here uh, to share with you this um, exciting G4LI uh, uh, discussion at Games for Change. You may have seen this project that uh, folks in my lab did. It's a game for math, um, and it's an estimation game about flagella. Um, but today, uh, uh, one of the things I want to do is switch gears a little bit in my brief time to talk a little bit about the things that I've been interested in for most of my career, which are gender imbalances in science, math, technology engineering, and um, some of the things that came up, of course, in any time we make games should, should uh, con continue in some of the research that we're working on and not forget that inequities can be reproduced in the games that we create just as much as they can be uh, conquered. So today I want to talk about unlearning biases in games, and um, what do I mean by that? I have a little video to show you. Hopefully that will work um, in a smooth fashion. Perhaps you have seen this video. It's really short. I'll just show a segment of it. Michaela is a seventh grader at a majority white middle school. Her responses completely change depending on the race of the children in the picture. Marcy and Renee are in school together and they're in the hallway and I'd like you to tell me what you think is happening in this picture. She probably looks like she's going to steal it because Marcy's like, oh no, what happened? And mm -hmm. he's like, hey look, 20 bucks. <laughs> and so do you think that Renee is doing something good, bad, or um, just neutral? I no, let me just think she... Video. I don't, I think she's going to take the money. Do you think that Renee and Marcy are likely to be friends or not? Not really. And what do you think about Marcy's parents? Do you think they'd be comfortable with her being friends with Renee or not? Ew. Um, well, if they find out the situation that happened... They look they like zombies, so I'm going to move on. Um, <laughs> apologies for that, but just so you get a sense of what this video is doing, it's interviewing um, students, and uh, perhaps some of you have seen this, where white students will interpret the African-American student as uh, stealing money, but when the roles are reversed um, and the African-American student has lost the money and the white student is, is picking up the money, the... Um, the student will actually think that the uh, white uh, person is assisting the African American. So there's these inherent biases. This this TV show, uh, this TV segment came out on CNN. It was an expose. They interviewed the students. Um, it was uh, really in response to the Trayvon Martin case. Um, and this, they interviewed the parents of the students and all of this kind of material. And it ended up being really shocking the way in which our society uh, has really embedded these deeply embedded stereotypes and biases about gender and race and all kinds of other things. And how how can we really even start to tackle this stuff. I mean, this, this comes out in, the, in, in even the most um, uh, uh, simplistic of our design tasks as designers and as educators. And so one of the things that I've been devoting my time to is thinking about ways in which our, our designs can take into account biases and stereotypes and perhaps focus on unlearning those biases and stereotypes. Um, so I have a, uh, everyone knows you can try out different perspectives in games and that's a strength of games. Um, and one of my researchers, Jeff Kaufman, who's a PhD in social psychology, has been working on ways in which we can study uh, the ways in which we can change beliefs and, uh, and, uh, and practices about biases and stereotypes through an idea called experience taking. And experience, you may have seen this, this has been on uh, national news in the last month about uh, this notion of experience taking and the way in which we can through narrative and through interactive experiences and through stories be able to take on the point of view of someone who is not like us and what are the most effective ways to do that. There are strategies actually which is really helpful to learn that's backed up by data and many of the studies. So I want to just briefly touch on that um, and note that um, there are ways in which, for example, if a story is told in a third person, the, the, uh, the, the reader is less likely to do experience taking than if the story is told in a first person. And if the story is told from an in-group or an out-group perspective, for example, if most of the uh, subject audience is, is, uh, is, is Caucasian American and they read about African American, where the... Um, where the differences are revealed in the story is, is the focus of the research. So, for example, if at the beginning of a narrative it's revealed that the protagonist in first person is a person of color and the reader is white, this has a very different response mechanism than if someone is revealed to be different during the course of the narrative. And so that lets us think about ways in which we can use um, very carefully, master the products and, and, and learning systems that we're creating to, uh, to include um, various kinds of voice. Now, there's this notion of, uh, of in-group and out-group and experience taking, and so how do we really prove this? You know, there's surveys, and of course we followed a lot of, um, my, my postdoc has followed a lot of, of research in this area, but one of the things that he did was he actually had a story about voting using these techniques, and then he measured to see who would vote. This is a very concrete way in which we can measure 
how, um, how this effect could actually happen and affect civic engagement and affect learning. So the first person perspective, when people are um, uh, working with an in-group um, and a story about voting, these, the, this, this percentage was actually the, the percentage that was um, likely to go out and vote. So for example, um, the uh, 43, 65% uh, uh, of the readers of the first person in-group narrative reported, reported voting on election day. And then my postdoc went and in the state of Ohio, um, voting is uh, a public record and he verified that indeed those people voted. So he went and found the data. So reading a story about voting from a person whose perspective is close to yours actually has an, a, a physical direct impact mm -hmm. on people's behavior throughout the, um, th throughout, uh, uh, the course of this particular study. So this is interesting stuff, right? This is a way in which we can, we, we can really understand um, human behavior and as it relates to now, of course, games. And really quickly, I have a very short period of time with you today, but I want to talk about this idea of transforming science, math, technology, and engineering through games. Uh, we have done several of these games um, where we're reworking stereotypes and biases, often with card games, very simple card games, board games, and then we can move them to iPad or whatever, but we really are, are doing this study to make sure that the games themselves um, have some interesting relationships to, um, to, uh, to data and to bias before we even build them. So we're looking at growth mindset, we're looking at um, other kinds of raising awareness, and we're following the, um, the notion that is purported by folks who have designed the IAT tests to see if we can change people's implicit associations about gender and race through playing a game. And in fact, this game and another game called Awkward Moment, we have found that we've been able to do so um, this is, oh yeah, this is, uh, we do a lot of these prototypes and some of them are physically embarrassing and humiliating. It's, it's fun, you know, it, we do a lot of different kinds of prototypes. But in our recent experiment, we have 56 participants that were randomly assigned to three conditions, a STEM bias game condition, a neutral game condition, and a control, control condition. And so we had a game that's kind of like apples to apples but we included science uh, and, and um, gender kind of stereotype moments. We call it awkward moments. You're in middle school and, and your brother says, girls aren't good at science, what do you do? These kinds of things. And we found some re really interesting stuff, much to my uh, surprise and delight, that um, in a, in a post-test, players who actually played with some stem and bias content in there without knowing that the, that the material is in there actually um, were much more likely to assign in a picture test afterwards that's based on an IAT the fact that women could be scientists. They were Basically, these, these games are working to open minds. And that is something that I've uh, worked for for a long time. And it's really quite interesting to also see how then um, they do so because that we've, we've found that the, the responses that students are showing Showing when, or the, the the subjects are showing during these tests are very interesting. When um, they put a more assertive response, they're actually the, the the more assertive responses against science and, and math and uh, biases were coming out. They, they they were actually more vehement in their responses in the science and math condition than in other conditions. So they're actually being more assertive. And so this for me is you know my brief snapshot here of some of the interesting research that I'm working on in conjunction for, with G4LI and funded by NSF. But I, I I'm also a practicing artist and and this quote by Andre Breton is something that leads me to do what I do, which is what must be the change is the game game itself, not the pieces. And um, I'm working to change these games to be a little bit more inclusive and open. Thank you.